talking with you about uh, Oracle Machine Learning, uh, an overview, and we'll even talk about uh, some futures as well, what's coming up in the uh, 2020 year. Uh, so again, my name is Mark Hornick, Senior Director of Product Management. Uh, our standard safe harbor statement, you know, the following content is intended to outline our general product direction. I'm sure you've seen this many times before. So let's get started with Oracle Machine Learning key attributes. Uh, we have uh, three key attributes that we'll focus on today, automated, scalable, and production ready. Notion with uh, data science and machine learning in particular is that there's a lot of let's call it grunt work that has to get done, uh, anything from data preparation to model building and evaluation. Um, and what we'd like to do is take much of that process and automate wherever possible. And that allows uh, not only data scientists, but other users to get better results faster with less effort. And uh, the non-expert users can uh, leverage machine learning uh, almost just as easily. Now, in the case of data volumes, we all know that data keeps increasing. Uh, we get more of it. We have not only the data that's in the enterprise, but we have supplemental data that's coming from third parties, whether it be weather data or social media data. And how do we handle those uh, big data volumes? Well, one way is to provide uh, algorithms and uh, uh, tools that uh, operate in a parallel distributed fashion. And so at this level, we're able to uh, build models, we're able to process data uh, at scale. Another aspect to this is the need or uh, avoidance of moving data. Uh, when you have to move large volumes of data, it inherently takes time and there's additional complexity there. And that can significantly impact uh, the scalability of um, a given solution. Now, even the best machine learning um, efforts and data science projects uh, can run into trouble when it comes to uh, getting their results into production. How do you deploy and further update, maintain your uh, data science solutions? Well, to have a production ready infrastructure that will allow you to get those solutions into production faster, uh, you can do that if your machine learning uh, tools are integrated in a broader platform. And so we'll be exploring these three areas and others uh, in this presentation with the end goal of uh, increasing productivity uh, for uh, users in the enterprise, um, allowing us to en achieve enterprise goals uh, faster and more effectively. And with the time left over, uh, innovate more, spend time on the value add aspects as opposed to just getting the, the process right. Now, Recently, we've rebranded uh, our machine learning capabilities at Oracle, uh, especially uh, with Oracle Database. So you might have heard of Oracle Advanced Analytics or the R Advanced Analytics for Hadoop, uh, Oracle R Enterprise. Well, we've provided this umbrella term of Oracle Machine Learning uh, representing our product family or platform. And so it consists of, um, APIs uh, for three popular uh, data science languages, SQL, uh, R, and coming soon, Python. We'll actually say more about Python in, in this session, so you get introduced to that. Uh, OML notebooks uh, using Apache Zeppelin to uh, interface with autonomous database, and I'll give you some introduction to what those uh, capabilities are. With Oracle Data Miner, it's a SQL developer extension that provides essentially a code-free environment for uh, doing machine learning, producing analytical workflows. And for the big data side, we have OML for Spark, which is based on our advanced analytics for uh, Hadoop. Now, OML microservices is something that is new uh, to the mix in that we've made it available for internal Oracle applications, uh, supporting uh, cognitive image and text and scoring and deployment and whatnot. But it was successful with uh, our internal applications, and so we wanted to make it generally available, and that's something that will be coming soon as well. Now, the Oracle machine learning tools uh, straddle both the on-premise side uh, as well as the cloud side. And so we'll be saying uh, more about that as we go forward. But before we do that, let's look at uh, enterprise users and how Oracle Machine Learning empowers enterprise users, such as data scientists, business and data analysts, DBA and IT professionals, application and dashboard developers, and of course, executives. 
if we look to data scientists, what is it that they really need from an environment, from a platform to be effective in their work? Well, one is data scientists want to use the popular data science languages. So most notably today, we see Python, R, and of course, SQL for uh, data manipulation. Um, and the open source environments also have a very rich ecosystem uh, for uh, third-party packages that can address many of the uh, techniques, algorithms, uh, visualizations that data scientists want to use. However, with larger data volumes, we do have to address the scalability and performance implications. And data scientists don't want to sit around uh, waiting for uh, models to build or for scoring to take place or getting their solutions into production. So having an infrastructure that enables scalability and performance is key. Now we had talked about automation earlier, and wherever we can automate uh, sort of the routine tasks of uh, the data science and machine learning process, uh, we can enhance user productivity. And this is going to be key as we see in later uh, uh, portions of this presentation. Data scientists don't operate in a vacuum, right? They need to interact with the other uh, roles in the enterprise. And so being able to collaborate with business analysts uh, and data analysts and get their results out to application and dashboard developers easily and access the data that the DB, uh, DBA and IT professionals have access to um, is really crucial. And so we want to provide tools that enable that uh, collaboration and give them access to the data that exists throughout the enterprise and beyond. Now, business and data analysts, of course, have a rich set of tools that they can use. And more so, they're starting to expand into the machine learning space. However, um, not all users are experts in machine learning. And so for those non-expert uh, machine learning users, we want to provide automation. And one of the components that I'll talk about later, AutoML, uh, will do just that. And that allows them to leverage their domain knowledge and get better results while using uh, machine learning capabilities. And of course, they want to be able to, to uptake the data scientists' results, collaborating with them and the other users in the uh, environment. DBAs and IT professionals, well, one of their goals is to ensure that the organization gets greater value uh, out of their Oracle investment. Uh, scalability and performance to support uh, data scientists and application and uh, dashboard developers. Um, having a simpler and streamlined infrastructure, especially as uh, you've heard with the Oracle Autonomous Database, uh, we're able to uh, have many of the routine tasks um, uh, automated and giving the DBAs and IT professionals more time to do other more value add activities. In particular, perhaps, not only will they be using uh, SQL, but also expanding their skill sets into Python and R, which will now be readily available uh, to them from the uh, Oracle database uh, platform. They also need to be able to leverage uh, database and big data sources and provide easy access to the various users within the organization. Now, if we look at application and dashboard developers, they want to realize intelligent solutions faster. And one of the ways to do that is when you have a machine learning infrastructure that is uh, integrated into the entire Oracle stack. So it's easy to uptake uh, data scientists R and Python uh, and even SQL scripts and rapidly deploy them. Because if the data scientist spent a lot of time uh, developing a really excellent uh, solution involving uh, an R or Python uh, uh, open source package even, uh, you don't want to have to recode that in some other language or have some other mechanism to uh, have the application or dashboard leverage that. And you can em embed these machine learning uh, results uh, through APIs like SQL and REST. And we'll see an example of that uh, shortly. Now, business executives, of course, they want to benefit from the world-class data management and technology and support that uh, Oracle offers and uh, provide machine learning across the enterprise because the more people who have access to these powerful tools, they can start analyzing their data for better uh, data-driven decisions themselves. And of course, that rolls up to uh, the executives in the organization. And being able to deploy solutions faster also allows them to realize uh, their return on investment. 
So when we look at uh, the cross-platform uh, machine learning capabilities, uh, we're going to examine a few areas here, just how these various pieces uh, tie together. And uh, at our next session, uh, uh, Wes Pritchard is going to go into even more detail uh, of how these relate. But for the moment, uh, we'll say we have multiple user interfaces and APIs available. So with user interfaces, we've got uh, notebooks, uh, SQL developer, popular R, and uh, Python IDEs so like RStudio or perhaps PyCharm or Jupyter. Uh, with OCI data science, uh, uh, they are a Python-based uh, Jupyter Lab interface, and so they'll be able to tie into our, our new Python API. With Oracle Analytics Cloud, dashboarding and reporting, uh, also working with uh, the same uh, machine learning capabilities. Now for APIs, we talked about SQL, R, and Python as uh, the programming languages uh, for data science, but we also have uh, REST APIs that are available for cloud application development. Now, from the database side, of course, there's the on-premise Oracle database, there's databases of service offerings, uh, and of course, then the Oracle uh, Autonomous uh, database, which consists of the Autonomous Data Warehouse and the Transaction Processing. So in these tools, we have in uh, database machine learning algorithms, and we can reach out to sources in the data lake uh, through tools like Oracle Cloud SQL and Oracle Big Data SQL. So whether we have other databases, uh, object storage, Amazon S3, uh, and big data service uh, resources as well, we can tie into those and access them as though they were uh, local uh, tables, doing aggregation, uh, filtering, other uh, data preparation uh, that can be combined with data that reside in uh, the uh, Oracle database for machine learning at that point. However, it is uh, quite possible that all of the data you want to work with is in the data lake. And so for that, we provide OML for Spark, uh, which it gives us an R interface and uh, powerful uh, algorithms directly uh, in the big data environment so that you can prepare your data, you can build models and score data uh, in that environment. Now we've talked about machine learning algorithms. Uh, this is kind of a union of all of the um, algorithms that we're providing uh, with uh, Oracle Machine Learning. You see we can support a range of use cases. Uh, there's the techniques for classification, regression, clustering, uh, attribute importance, association rules. And there are various uh, algorithms that are uh, supporting each of these. Uh, each algorithm has unique qualities and they uh, process data, they extract rules in a different way and have different um, uh, insight that are offered into uh, the data. Now with Oracle Database, we also have uh, SQL analytics capabilities like windows, patterns, and aggregates. Text mining support, we can actually combine uh, data that is unstructured, uh, say a column of data, and automatically extract the tokens, uh, um, the terms from that, uh, TFIDF, and combine that with the structured data. And this is built in with the algorithm. So part of this uh, automation that I'm uh, referring to. Uh, R and Python packages. So we'll be talking about how we can leverage third-party packages in combination to ex further extend the suite that we're providing here. So let's take a look at the Oracle machine learning notebooks. Now, Autonomous Database, of course, is a data platform, but we're further expanding that as a data science platform. Uh, provides a collaborative UI, as we said, based on Apache Zeppelin, supporting uh, the wide range of uh, users in our ecosystem. Uh, but it allows for easy sharing of, of notebooks. So that say if you had multiple users opening the same notebook, changes made by one user can immediately be seen by the other users. So this really facilitates uh, working together uh, to solve uh, business problems. And these can then be produced as templates that you can access uh, later uh, to share with others in the organization. And you have the ability to specify permissions, versioning, and uh, scheduling of jobs uh, as well. So if you have a solution that you want to run uh, periodically, every night, once a week, uh, those can be uh, scheduled uh, within the tool. This is all included with Autonomous Database, so it's automatically provisioned, managed, and, and backed up. And we're providing access to all of the in-database SQL algorithms and analytic functions. And soon this will be augmented with Python and R, but I'll say more about that towards the end. 
So what I'd like to do is show you a brief um, demo of uh, the autonomous uh, database. We're gonna be logging in uh, with the uh, user 20 uh, login. And you see when we come to this screen, we have notebooks, jobs, examples. Well, we're gonna go into some notebooks. Uh, we can, of course, create uh, new notebooks. We can uh, import notebooks uh, from other users or ones that we've saved ourselves. But let's look at uh, forecasting sales. So as we get into this, we're going to be forecasting uh, sales using an exponential smoothing algorithm uh, for time series data. And we can identify how we'd like to connect to uh, the database uh, for priorities with low, medium, or high through a setting of interpreter bindings. To get started with this example, we're first going to drop the model because our models are first class objects in the database. And we're going to have the model called ESM Sales Forecast 1. We'll then create a view for the data that we wish to uh, use for modeling. And that's going to be from the sales history data. We have a timestamp ID. We have a, an amount sold. And that's what we're going to use for this time series example. Now, to build the model, uh, we can specify that through SQL. Uh, because the notebook environment so far is supporting uh, the SQL uh, language. And that will be extended to uh, R and Python going forward. But we have a variety of settings that we can have to the uh, model, the hyperparameters, if you will. And then we'll go ahead and uh, invoke the create model two function. So we'll provide a model name that we'd like to use for our first class model object in the database, ESM sales forecast one. That the mining function is time series. Uh, the data query that we're providing is from the ESM SH data, the hyperparameters that we specified earlier, as well as the case ID and target. So our model's already built, so we can take a look at what were the settings that uh, the model actually used uh, for this. So it will take what has been provided, and there are other settings that if you didn't specify them, it will choose intelligent defaults. We can then look at the global diagnostics and uh, model quality uh, aspects uh, through the uh, DM dollar view that you see here from the uh, select uh, statement. Now, if we want to look at the predictions themselves, the forecasts, uh, we can do that using the DM dollar VP uh, view that you see here. We view that, we have the actual sold, of course, the forecast for the four uh, points that we wanted, and uh, the confidence bounds, the, both the lower and upper. Now, to visualize this using uh, the uh, Zeppelin native capabilities, we can uh, simply execute a similar query and then look at the uh, results uh, in the visualization. We can specify this through keys and various values uh, to plot the data. So that's a very quick overview of um, uh, the notebook environment. So let's turn our attention to uh, Oracle Machine Learning for SQL uh, in a little more detail. So of course, the goal of this is to empower SQL users with immediate access to machine learning in both Oracle Database and Autonomous Database. Now, we've said that we have in-database parallel distributed algorithms, right? That's very important for achieving scalability and performance. But the models are first-class database objects, so that means that um, you can assign permissions to them, uh, you can find out which models exist in this in, uh, environment, uh, importing and exporting models across databases, doing a batch and real-time scoring. Uh, one of the questions we had uh, submitted early was about real-time scoring, so I'll show you uh, an example of doing singleton scoring uh, with the model from, uh, from SQL in a moment because predictions are no longer uh, considered uh, reasonable if they're just black box. We need explanatory predictive details, for various regulatory reasons. You can't just say a person is uh, denied, uh, say, credit. You have to explain why uh, they were uh, denied credit. And so your models have to have those predictive details uh, available uh, with scoring. And of course, you can leverage this across the Oracle stack uh, because it's uh, SQL based. Most uh, things within uh, this environment uh, have access uh, to SQL uh, right away. Now, we've already seen how to build a model and we did the time series model. This is one for classification where we wish to uh, predict uh, from the customer insurance lifetime value uh, table who's likely to buy insurance. 
and the target column is whether or not the person will buy insurance. So from the real-time scoring standpoint, or what we can also call singleton scoring, we select the prediction probability using the model name. The buy insurance one is now a first-class object in the database, so we can reference it as such. We want to uh, predict uh, yes, that the customer is going to buy using the uh, values, the predictors uh, that uh, we have specified uh, directly in the query. So by executing this query, we see that this particular uh, customer has a 93% chance of buying uh, insurance. And this model uh, exists in the database and the prediction takes place in the database. And we can simply execute a query to achieve that. Another interface is Oracle Data Miner. It's creating, uh, allowing you to create analytical workflows and it supports largely the citizen data scientists, although uh, data scientists and, and other users have found it to be quite uh, effective as a, uh, a SQL developer extension uh, for Oracle Database because it automates uh, a lot of the uh, data science steps. So whether you want to build multiple models uh, uh, at, in one node, uh, or if you wish to evaluate those models, it will do a lot of that um, processing for you automatically. It has an easy drag and drop uh, interface, so the uh, nodes on the right hand side can be dropped, uh, drew, drawn on the uh, canvas and connecting uh, those um, uh, nodes to form the analytical uh, workflows, which can then be shared. You can export them and import them for uh, sharing with other users. And the wide range of algorithms and data transformations are provided to, uh, to support your machine learning needs. Uh, when you get finished, you can generate SQL code uh, for immediate deployment. And this can be incorporated into uh, application uh, for uh, doing the entire workflow that uh, has been designed. So let's turn our attention to external uh, tools that require data and what some of the issues are that we encounter. So we have the data source, Let's, we could call it uh, Oracle Database or uh, some other tool, um, and environments like R or Python, Excel, or some other third-party uh, uh, analytic engine. Well, traditionally, flat files have been the uh, mechanism for getting data into these tools. We uh, request an extract, say, from our DBA or from uh, the IT organization, and we have to import that into uh, our tools, and all that data has to fit. Um, but if we don't like the data that we got, we might have to go back and request a different set, so we don't have immediate access to that. Now, some uh, users may have uh, the fortunate uh, access to the database directly. So connectivity packages from R, maybe it's R Oracle or R JDBC, uh, Python, CX Oracle to say the Oracle database. Um, but when you have this solution here, how are you going to manage getting this into production as well? Do you have to manually spawn the R Python uh, engines? How do you deal with the scripts and the um, objects that are being produced. If you're generating models, where do those exist? Uh, how do we deal with a number of other issues like the access latency just to pull the data into these other environments? Maybe there's a paradigm shift from uh, R and Python to some other language um, and back, which may or may not be convenient for uh, the user. We talk about memory limitations. Well, these tools typically require the data to be fully loaded in order to operate on them. If the data is too large uh, for available memory, uh, you have to take other approaches, which could mean uh, sampling that data outside of the tool. Uh, and then you still have to have enough memory left over to process, uh, to do the type of ana analysis that you want. Even if you have a powerful desktop machine or uh, analytics machine, many of the packages and the environments themselves are single threaded. They can't take advantage of uh, parallelism. So that's going to limit your scalability and performance. We've already mentioned sort of backup recovery and security. When you have a lot of moving parts, it's more difficult to keep track of all of this. And then getting it into production often results in uh, uh, custom approaches for each project because there isn't a common infrastructure to support that. So enter. Oracle Machine Learning for R and Python. 
these are two uh, APIs. Uh, R is available today with Oracle Database. Python will be coming soon. Uh, and both are coming soon to the Oracle Autonomous Database. Well, these interfaces empower uh, data scientists to uh, work with data at scale. And other users are in Python users as well. The idea here is that we're taking uh, the Oracle database and leveraging it as a high performance compute environment. So by having uh, proxies for tables and views in Oracle database, we can manipulate that data from a native R and Python interface by having overloaded uh, a select set of functions to perform those operations on the database server. We also have access to the in-database algorithms. So we're not pulling data out to a third-party engine. We're actually building those models on the data in the database and keeping the models themselves there. Now, when we have R and Python scripts, those scripts can be uh, stored and managed within Oracle database. And the objects that you produce, whether they be models or visualizations or other uh, objects, those can all be stored in the database. So you have a central repository for managing those. No more you know, hundreds or thousands of files that have to be managed as part of a solution. These results can then be easily integrated into applications and dashboards through a SQL interface. And we'll see an example of that shortly. Uh, with this, we're able to leverage third-party packages so that uh, one of the features that I'll uh, go through an example with is embedded execution. You can actually include third-party packages with your uh, user-defined R functions and uh, have those uh, incorporated into the uh, solution. So the key functional areas of the transparency layer, uh, machine learning algorithms, embedded execution, and with uh, OML for Pi, automated machine learning, we're going to look at uh, next. Now, when we look at the transparency layer, one of the benefits of uh, leveraging Oracle Database as a high-performance compute engine is the ability to take advantage of powerful indexing, query optimization, uh, parallelism, and partitioning that is all part of the database infrastructure. So if we have, say, a pandas data frame, and right now we're just going to focus on the Python API. One, it's new, and uh, two, we have very similar functionality available in R, uh, which has been around now for close to 10 years. Uh, so we have a pandas data frame, and we can say we'd like to name the table in the database Boston. So we say oml.create. We get back a proxy object for that data. Now, if the table already exists in the database, we can sync that and get a proxy object there. Now, once we have one of these proxy objects, we can invoke uh, overloaded functions like shape, uh, what are the dimensions of this table, or compute statistics, the standard deviation or skew, or perhaps we want to uh, use standard Python syntax uh, with the split function to get back a train and test uh, data sets from our original uh, proxy object. But note also that these uh, results, train and test, themselves are proxy objects because we don't want to pull the data back to the client. We want to operate on it in place. And many of the results that we return will be proxy objects themselves. So let's take a look at the in-database modeling. And in this case, we're going to focus on support vector machine. So we have the OML package. We're going to import SVM. We'll get our proxy object for a table called onTime S, which uh, contains uh, flight information. And uh, we want to look for some anomalies in that data. So we might specify an outlier rate of 1%. We want a linear kernel. And then we're going to fit that model uh, using the data uh, on time S, which of course is a proxy. So if we look on the right, we have Oracle database, which has the data, it has the algorithm, and the model is being produced in the database. Now, if we want to look at that model, we can uh, interrogate the various views uh, for that or uh, view the uh, model uh, itself as a Python object but you did not have to move any data into the client in order for this to take place. So embedded execution, I mentioned this earlier. Um, this particular example will highlight uh, parallel execution for a partitioned uh, data flow using a third-party package. Uh, you can certainly do things in a non-parallel fashion, but uh, this example shows how parallelism can be applied. Uh, Consider the data scientist that wants to uh, build multiple models on different partitions of the database. 
set. We're looking at the iris data set. It's a popular one that uh, contains measurements of iris flowers from three different species. So we're going to build a model uh, in a function called buildLM, and it's going to predict the petal length from the petal width and return that model. It's leveraging the sklearn uh, package, so we have the linear model from that. Because we want to tailor the model to each species, uh, we'll identify an index on the species column. We could have multiple columns involved in partitioning of the data. Then we'll invoke group apply, where the iris data frame uh, proxy object is going to be partitioned according to the index. We're going to invoke the function build lm on that. Notice we're passing in a function object, but we could also have stored this function in the Python script repository and then invoked it by name. And lastly, how many parallel Python engines we would like to execute this. Now in the on-premise uh, uh, deployment, we see that Oracle Database is going to be using uh, external processes to spawn the Python engines. It will load the function into it, the data, and the resulting models will still remain in the database. And we can pull those back to the client when we want to look at those. So here's an example of showing the SQL API, where we have a very simple function called random red dots. And this uh, function takes uh, two uh, arguments of the number of dots for two different scatter plots and also returns a data frame, a very simple data frame of two columns and, uh, and 10 rows. And we're going to store this function in the uh, Python script repository so we can invoke it by name from SQL. We could just as easily have um, created this from uh, the Python interface. To get the images, we'll invoke the table function pyq eval, specifying the PNG. And here you can see the uh, images that are being returned directly from SQL Developer. So these could be arbitrarily complex images, uh, visualizations that you've generated using your favorite uh, Python uh, uh, package. Now, if we look at uh, the ability to specify additional uh, arguments. We have the uh, number of dots one and two, and we can incorporate those into the execution. And then we'll get images that are modified accordingly. To get the structured results, we do this by specifying what the shape of the resulting table looks like. So here we're specifying select one ID and one val to say that we want an ID column and a value column that are numeric. And uh, you see we have the table uh, produced that could be uh, materialized or um, uh, joined with other data. Now, if you want to get both the structured and unstructured or image content together, we give the option of generating XML. So not only do you have the structured content there, but you have the images in C data, which is a base 64 encoding of the PNG images. So any application uh, or tool that can leverage uh, XML can incorporate both the structured and image results uh, directly. So let's move on to AutoML. Uh, as we noted earlier, this is new with uh, OML for Pi, and it's only available with OML for Pi. Uh, its goal is to increase data scientist productivity and sort of reduce the overall compute time itself. As we go into you know, cloud-based uh, interfaces, uh, reducing compute time is, uh, is good, certainly from the user's perspective. So what does AutoML do? Well, we have three main areas, uh, model selection, feature selection, and hyperparameter tuning. Uh, with model selection, uh, we showed earlier that we have uh, a range of uh, classification and regression algorithms. Well, which algorithm should you choose? Uh, AutoML uh, works today uh, with the classification regression algorithms only, but if you've got five, six, seven different algorithms to choose from, uh, do you do an exhaustive search, building models on each of them, and do we change the parameters for that? Um, with the auto model selection, we actually are using a technique called meta-learning, where uh, we've built a model to guide the machine learning process. So we can recommend which algorithms are most likely uh, appropriate 
for the data based on the distribution of the various predictors and targets. So we produce uh, a best model faster than uh, with exhaustive search. But once you know what algorithm you want, uh, there's also this notion of selecting the features or the predictors that you want to use when building that model, because not all features are useful and different sets of uh, features may be appropriate for different algorithms. So if we can reduce the number of features by identifying those that are most predictive, we not only improve performance because we're processing less data, but we might also achieve greater accuracy. And I'll show an example of that next. For the hyperparameter tuning, uh, the goal here is given an algorithm and a set of features, can we tune the uh, hyperparameters in a way that will significantly improve accuracy? And again, we want to avoid the exhaustive search technique. So there's a meta-learning approach here where we're taking a gradient descent, uh, uh, zeroing in on the uh, uh, best hyperparameters uh, to, to achieve that goal. Now, with this in place, we're not only uh, automating this to increase the data scientist productivity, but think about it from the non-expert user uh, perspective. They can also now leverage machine learning because they don't need to know the details of the individual algorithms and what all the specific parameters for each of those algorithms or hyperparameters uh, refer to. This part of the process is taken care of. Now, does this sort of replace the data scientist? Well, no, because we still have the formulation of the problem, the uh, acquiring and uh, integration of the data, and the preparation of that data before it even gets to this process. And that's really critical uh, as well. But this is a way of uh, overall addressing some of those uh, repetitive tasks that need to be done, uh, and those are uh, readily uh, automated. Now for feature selection, here's a very simple example. Uh, one of the things that Oracle Labs did, uh, where this is based on a technology from Oracle Labs, is they evaluated a wide range of data sets. And here's just one, uh, 56,000 rows, almost 800 columns. Uh, with the feature selection, you're able to achieve a 60% reduction in the number of features uh, and getting an 18% increase in accuracy because we're eliminating noise uh, from the data. And it was like 1.3 times faster to do this using an SVM Gaussian model. So it definitely is a uh, possibility for significant benefits uh, with uh, feature selection. So let's turn our attention to machine learning for Spark uh, on the big data side of things. Now this is supported by uh, the Oracle R Advanced Analytics for Hadoop uh, component of the uh, big data connectors. And its goal is to leverage the Spark 2 environment uh, for powerful data preparation and machine learning. Uh, it can work across the range of uh, data lake sources, many of which we've seen in that earlier slide. We can achieve scalability and performance using uh, the full Hadoop cluster. And this is achieved in part because we have machine learning algorithms that are both native and leveraging the Spark MLlib implementations. And these are all rolled into the uh, same uh, OML for Spark uh, framework. You might notice that uh, the interface here mimics what we've done on the database side. So we have a transparency layer, a set of parallel distributed machine learning algorithms, and a compute framework that uh, enables the data parallel and task parallel execution in combination with uh, open source packages so that you can uh, build uh, advanced um, uh, solutions leveraging the open source environment. OML for Spark performance is one that uh, certainly is important to uh, users in the big data space. And here's a comparison of the native OML for Spark GLM logistic regression uh, with the Spark MLlib, which is also integrated into uh, this platform. With the native implementation, we see that um, when the data fits in memory, we're up to seven times faster than the uh, Spark MLlib uh, algorithm on the same platform. Um, what, what's interesting is that uh, when the data can't fit in memory, uh, the OML for Spark implementation is still able to uh, solve that even at uh, 10 billion rows. Now, you might not have 10 billion rows that you need to build a model on, but it goes to the uh, underlying architecture and how the algorithms are designed and implemented to even enable such uh, a capability. 
Moving on to uh, applications, uh, integrating uh, Oracle Machine Learning. Uh, over the past decade or so, we've worked uh, with uh, various applications groups to incorporate uh, machine learning uh, capabilities, whether it's human capital management, uh, customer relationship management, uh, financial services, uh, spend classification, uh, and more recently, uh, content and experience for unstructured data analytics and uh, integration cloud for digital process automation. I'm going to focus on those last two uh, next, mainly because they tie into the OML microservices, which I want to say a little bit more about. Um, with the integration cloud, it's, uh, we said, focused on data process integration, but it's to help business users make uh, better decisions using machine uh, learning models. Um, and this will increase the automation of human-centric approval workflows. Now, within the um, uh, Oracle applications, there are a variety of um, uh, software as a service process centric apps that leverage this technology. But what are they using? They're using the Oracle machine learning platform uh, to uh, build models in autonomous database and then deploy them using the uh, microservices. Now, another example being content and experience is really cool from the visualization side where uh, they improve content discoverability. So if you'd like to search or organize your content or maybe you want to tag uh, images, videos and, and text, um, this is a tool that enables you to do just that. And it's leveraging the OML cognitive microservices, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. So that brings us to the uh, roadmap uh, for Oracle machine learning. Uh, Oracle has really invested a great deal in machine learning uh, ever since it acquired uh, thinking machines back in 1999. Uh, so basically uh, over 20 years, we've been uh, incorporating machine learning into Oracle database and the overall uh, Oracle stack. Um, so let's see what we're going to be doing in the coming year. OML microservices. I mentioned that you know, we've made this available to uh, internal Oracle applications teams, but because of the success there, uh, we're going to be making it generally available for uh, uh, other users, uh, customers. And so uh, model management services, whether it's building and deploying uh, models, uh, model, uh, monitoring the accuracy of models for uh, prediction and predictor drift, as indicating basically when should you rebuild your model. Uh, having a model repository to store version and compare uh, models, uh, cognitive services, feature extraction, image and text, and user-defined scripts deployment. Uh, so we can take our Python and R user-defined functions that we were using perhaps in the uh, embedded uh, execution case and invoke those through a REST API. Of course, all of these microservices are uh, made available through uh, REST endpoints for ease of application integration. These are just a few examples of the microservices uh, APIs. So if we're dealing with model management, uh, we of course want to find out which models do we have available, can we version them, um, get back a specific version, model deployment, scoring, uh, and finding out what are the uh, needed uh, parameters for that model to do scoring, cognitive image, uh, image classification, uh, not suitable for work classification, object and face detection, image and face similarity, case of cognitive text, uh, named entity recognition, uh, topic extraction, keywords, uh, sentiment summary, and similarity of documents. So the wide range of things that um, uh, we'll be uh, making available there. Now with Oracle Database 20C, uh, we've had a number of uh, frequently requested algorithms and two that we'll be uh, adding uh, are XGBoost, uh, supporting a range of uh, uh, mining functions, classification, regression, et cetera. Uh, and of course, everyone knows probably that XGBoost is a highly popular and powerful algorithm uh, that uh, has been used in uh, Kaggle competitions uh, to win uh, basically uh, the um, uh, the best uh, accuracy. So uh, it will be a nice addition to uh, our database uh, suite of, uh, of tools. Uh, another algorithm is MSET SPRT, and this is based on an Oracle Labs algorithm, and its intent is to support anomaly detection for sensor data. Uh, certainly IoT data sources are becoming more and more prevalent, and the need to uh, identify uh, where some of the data values could be signaling uh, trouble. Imagine if you have a farm of um, 
of wind turbines. Uh, each wind turbine has many sensors and you might want to know exactly what's going on with each one of those. And is there a combination of problems that uh, could result in uh, downtime and do this across all uh, turbines in a given farm? Well, this is you know, one possible uh, use case. As far as expanding autonomous database with uh, Python and R, uh, we've mentioned that autonomous database grows as a data science platform. And with the OML notebooks, we'll be adding support uh, to extend our SQL uh, uh, interface with Python and R. So that means in the same notebook, you'll be able to include paragraphs uh, of each of the languages. So perhaps you'd like to use SQL for some initial uh, data munging. Maybe you want to use R for some visualization and then Python for model building or vice versa. Uh, so you can combine these in the same uh, document. Uh, of course, your Python and R scripts can be managed in the database, and you'll have access to the scalable execution through the transparency layer and in-database machine learning algorithms. With the OML for Pi, uh, AutoML will be uh, made available here as well. And uh, with the OCI data science, uh, OML for Pi uh, will be integrated there so that you'll be able to reach out from the uh, Python environment provided by uh, data science uh, toolkit into uh, autonomous database and the in-database uh, algorithms. With respect to um, another interface, we've talked a lot about AutoML, but that was uh, code-based, right? It's gonna be Python. And we would like to provide a code-free user interface that uh, supports this automated end-to-end -end machine learning. So not only do we enhance the productivity of data scientists and the user experience, because they can really get a jump start on producing a model quickly, and then they can see, well, do I need to refine that? Do I need to uh, change some of the parameters or the data and the like? But we can also make that available to non-expert users uh, who can leverage ML for the same reasons that we cited back with uh, the OML for Pi, uh, Python uh, interface. But this tool will go a little bit further in supporting the model deployment and monitoring and uh, also support model management. So in the case of monitoring, we'd like to know, is the model degrading over time? Has, is its accuracy changing? Uh, is there drift in the uh, prediction uh, or the predictors that are there that we should uh, consider rebuilding the model? So we'll be saying uh, more about that in future uh, sessions. With OML for R and uh, Python, we'll be uh, exposing additional uh, uh, OML for SQL algorithms uh, to R and Python. And uh, we'll be supporting the R and Python uh, releases uh, there as well. Um, enabling uh, Oracle database standard integration, installation, patching, upgrade, and downgrade. This will be uh, integrated more uh, seamlessly with uh, that for our on-premise users. With OML for Spark, this is going to be a new cloud-based architecture, and it will support uh, machine learning activities on big data, including model management and cognitive services, uh, deployment and monitoring. And this will be achieved through uh, cloud-oriented packaging focused on uh, containers and REST APIs. And by providing this new architecture, it will make it easier to have a uniform experience across both the database and the big data by providing the same OML for Pi and R interfaces uh, in both environments so that uh, users can uh, be less aware of where their data actually uh, resides. In the case of algorithms, there will be a number of uh, enhancements there. Uh, neural networks, um, support vector machine will be a new algorithm added, as well as uh, clustering algorithms. And those are new native algorithms. Uh, we already have uh, those with uh, the um, Spark MLlib. Now, GPUs, of course, are very um, important in the deep learning space, and so we would like to uh, take advantage of those by enabling GPUs for the in-database algorithms. Uh, we'll be replacing MKL with uh, QBLAS. Um, by having GPU shapes available, uh, we can then have our user-defined R and Python functions that might take advantage of packages that uh, uh, can uh, use GPUs like uh, TensorFlow and Keras um, uh, have that same performance gain. And because the OML microservices for GPU uh, uh, processing, uh, that will be useful for uh, images because the algorithms that are there are also deep learning algorithms uh, that uh, support both images and text uh, for a high performance. 
So wrapping this up, uh, we have the Oracle machine learning key attributes. We've talked about how automation is uh, certainly important and uh, critical for a lot of users to help streamline the whole uh, data science machine learning process. The need for dealing with scalable uh, solutions that you can't really uh, work with enterprise level data unless you have in, uh, parallel distributed algorithms and infrastructure to support that. And in the case of uh, putting your results into uh, production, having the infrastructure that makes it a seamless process to go from the um, uh, models into a, uh, an application or dashboard uh, is certainly a key. So we're looking to increase productivity, achieve enterprise goals, and uh, give you more time to focus on the things that uh, are more innovative and more interesting to solve uh, business problems. For more information, you can go to the uh, oracle.com slash go to slash machine learning uh, site. This will bring you to a number of resources for Oracle machine learning. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to entertain any uh, questions. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so we've had a few questions here uh, in the chat. Um, I replied to a few. We are working, I'm working on one specifically, uh, people asking about um, OML for Pi, whether it can be used for data um, on uh, file storage, like data lake without the database. Well, so today, uh, or I should say in the near future, because OML for Pi is not released yet, it is a database um, a capability. So it does require uh, Oracle Autonomous Database or uh, Oracle Database on Premise or Database as a Service. Um, that said, you can reach out to uh, uh, data lake uh, sources through uh, the um, uh, Cloud SQL and Big Data SQL. In the future, as I mentioned with the uh, OML for Spark, that that will have uh, a, uh, an OML for Pi interface that would allow you to work directly on big data, and that would be uh, without requiring uh, Oracle database. But for the, uh, you know, certainly the, the near term that we're talking about, uh, it will require Oracle database. Perfect. Um, also, other questions. Um, will support for SQL developer data miner continue or will we be replaced by ADW, notebooks, etc.? Well, the existing Oracle data miner uh, will uh, continue uh, in its current form. We will uh, provide uh, you know, maintenance uh, support for that. Uh, but our main focus is uh, driven toward the cloud. And you know, we're looking at the uh, AutoML UI and continuing to expand that. Uh, what we've shown you know, so far is just sort of scratching the surface of where we'd like to take that. And so um, uh, that's where we'll be investing our uh, development resources, um, uh, at least as, uh, for the, uh, the coming year. Excellent. Um, also another question regarding um, the um, running the ML processes in the same instance running the OLTP system. So how is the load managed? Well, the load will be uh, as you would expect for uh, any uh, load being placed on the, uh, the uh, system uh, that is supporting it. Um, if you, you would have to scale your uh, database uh, resources uh, accordingly, uh, as you would a de decision support system is what we uh, we normally say to uh, to those types of, of issues. I think if you are using open source tools and you want to have uh, a large number of um, say Python and R uh, instances running on the back end, you'll want to factor that into the amount of compute that you have available both for, uh, for the database and for those uh, other uh, engines because they, they do interact, uh, they consume resources. So essentially we're providing an, an engineering solution uh, with this and so we have to take into account the um, realities of the hardware that is available to support what's being demanded of it. Excellent. Another one um, that uh, came in is also about um, the uh, if we can export machine learning models in PMML from OML. Yes. Um, 
the PMML representation is one that you know we've explored uh, many years ago, actually. And um, at this point, the the models exist in the kernel of the database, and we leverage those models uh, directly in the database, right? Especially um, with the um, OML for SQL, uh, R, and, and Python. And so exporting them to a, a separate representation is not something that we have um, enabled, uh, certainly through, through PMML. Um, with the microservices, there will be more of a scoring engine type capability that will allow you to use these models outside of the database, but that's something that uh, will be coming when the OML microservices uh, are made available. Excellent. And I think a, a great question uh, as well, which uh, might get clarified in the next session uh, even more, but is what is the differentiation factor from uh, OML with R and Python versus uh, OCI data science? Well, I think one of the, the key differences there is um, uh, the data science interface is focused on the data scientist. Uh, it is uh, looking at having a Python interface only. Um, one of the differentiators is that with uh, the database, we have SQL, Python, um, and R made available uh, for that. With the data science also, they're targeting more the open source aspect of that and where data is not necessarily in uh, Oracle database. So if you have data that's in um, you know, object storage or, or other representations where you're not planning on putting it into Oracle database, then certainly that would be a, a natural uh, environment uh, for Python users to, to take advantage of. Uh, they have um, uh, capabilities for uh, AutoML uh, enabled, and um, we have that with our Python uh, interface uh, as well. So I think there are definitely uh, synergies between the two, and that's one of the reasons for having the OML for Pi uh, package uh, enabled with um, the OCI data science because it will allow those users to leverage some of the capabilities that uh, the data science offering has and go into the autonomous database and get all of the benefits of the in-database modeling and uh, preparation uh, and scalability that OML for Pi is providing. Excellent. So we are now at the top of the hour. Um, uh, people are asking, oh, 2020 Q3 or Q4? I guess that's related to OML for Spark. So I, I, can, I can speak about that um, uh, <laughs> a little later. Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, OML for Spark will be made available with the big data service. Um, probably as soon as we get it done. So as soon as Big Data Service is out, we're gonna have some instructions and scripts on how to install our Mail for Spark um, in there. And then following that uh, launch, we will work on getting uh, integration with the Oracle Dataflow as well. Okay. All right, so um, it's the top of the hour. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all the participants and I see you guys uh, next month. Thank you very much, Mark, okay. really appreciate it. Thank you, Marcos, and thanks, everyone. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.